Kentucky Senator Rand Paul says he's disappointed that the president has in some cases used the families of gun victims as props to push gun control. Senator Paul's comments came Wednesday during an interview with the Christian Science Monitor. This is about an hour. So I'm going to call on you, I'm going to do a little intro, call on you for okay. remarks for a couple of minutes and then okay. we'll do questions and then we'll end promptly at 9.30. Okay everybody, here we go. Let's see what, let's see what iron control A exercise. I'm Dave Cook from The Monitor. Thanks for, thank you for coming. Our guest today is Senator Rand Paul. This is his first visit with the group. He was born in Texas, attended Baylor University before being admitted to Duke University where he earned his medical degree, established his ophthalmology practice in Bowling Green, Kentucky, founded an anti-tax group called Kentucky uh, Taxpayers United, and in 2009 in his first bid for elective office, our guest ran for the Senate seat vacated by retiring Senator Jim Bunning. He routed the Republican establishment's candidate in the primary and won decisively in the general. When he got to the Senate, he quickly founded the Tea Party Caucus. Finally, for you uh, breakfast Tea Party buffs, a group of which I may be the only member, of our nearly 3,800 breakfasts, only two times that we had both a father and a son as guests, we hosted our guest dad, former Representative Ron Paul, in September 2011. The only other father-son team was Mitt Romney and his dad, Michigan Governor George Romney. So much for biography and breakfast trivia. Now on to mundane mechanical matters. As always, we're on the record. Please, no live blogging or tweeting. In short, no filing of any kind while the breakfast is underway. There's no embargo when the breakfast is over, except that C-SPAN has agreed not to use video of the session for at least an hour after the breakfast ends to give those of us in the room a chance to file. If you'd like to ask a question, please do the traditional thing and send me a subtle, non-threatening signal, and I'll happily call on one and all. We'll start off, now that he's had two bites, we'll start off by offering our guests the opportunity to make some opening comments, then we'll move to questions from around the table. And with that, Senator, thanks again for doing this. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. It, it sounds like with all those rules that we're going to really create some news this morning. I don't, I don't know about that. but. As I was shaking everybody's hand, we live was, in hope. Senator. Yeah, we live in hope. As I was going around the room and shaking everybody's hand, I was thinking, you know, I was sort of in a wedding receiving line. So if anybody feels compelled to send me a wedding gift, I can get <laughs> you an address. Um, I think it has to be under fourteen dollars, though, to meet the Senate gift limits. But um, no, I'm glad to be here this morning. And I was told anything short of uh, thirteen hours of speaking would be fine. <laughs> and so I'll try to keep my remarks concise. In fact, I think question and answer will probably do us in service better. But um, I am uh, glad to be here. I uh, came to Washington because I want to make a difference. I think that our nation faces significant problems, and I think if we don't address the deficit, if we don't address it, um, I've become more and more convinced that we don't necessarily go gradually into problems, that we could go precipitously into a problem. 
And I say that with reference to 2008 and to the crisis that uh, I think there is, uh, even when things seem to be going pretty well, there is some, there is and are some lurking uh, dangers in our, within our economy. One would be uh, interest rates rising. And I ask this question all the time to people I consider to be, uh, you know, smart, big bankers, people, you know, in the major capital centers of the world. Uh, can we control interest rates and keep interest rates for low? Is there a breaking point at which the central bank cannot keep interest rates at this point? Because uh, interest rates of 5 percent, interest rates of 7 percent, or when I was a kid, interest rates of, you know, 19 percent or 21 percent, I think would be catastrophic with this burden of debt. Um, seems to work right now, but I also think that there's a certain illusion uh, both of wealth um, in the stock market and an illusion of uh, the ease at which we can ha manage our debt. And so those are my concerns. And uh, I think because of that, we have to do some long range things. I've proposed uh, several things since I've come. Uh, I've proposed fixing the Social Security problem. We're six and a half trillion dollars short. To me, it's an, an actuarial problem. You simply raise the age gradually a couple months a year, raise it to 70, and you fix two-thirds of the Social Security deficit. You can fix the remaining third by means testing uh, the benefits. Um, I thought that there'd be bipartisan support for that because the President has occasionally said he was for entitlement reform. But uh, he, I think, has not shown much leadership on this. Seems to be inching more towards it, but I had a meeting with him and uh, 40, back when we used to have 47 Republican senators, we sat down around a table like this with he and the Vice President. So uh, this is probably a year and a half ago. And I told him precisely that, that uh, I think we should be able to get people on both sides of the equation just to fix, uh, just essentially fix Social Security. Medicare is a more difficult problem. It's 35 to $40 trillion short. And these are the problems that drive our deficit. Two-thirds of your budget is, is, and everybody here knows this, two-thirds of the budget is, is entitlements. So we have another bill that fixes Medicare. It's more difficult, though. It's 35 to $40 trillion in the hole. We do the same thing to Medicare. We raise the age gradually over about 20 years, similar to what they did in 1983. We means test the benefits, means test the premiums, means test everything. And uh, unfortunately, that doesn't fix the problem. So even with raising the age and means testing, you don't fix the problem in Medicare. You do have to have some market forces. So I thought, well, you know, it was John Kerry's idea in his presidential election to put everybody in the whole country into the federal employee benefits plan, uh, the federal health insurance plan. So I said, this was a Democrat idea. This will be easy. I'll just go to John Kerry and say, Let's use your idea, not for the whole country, but let's use it for senior citizens. Let everybody have the federal employee health plan. I think the public would like it if they were told they're getting the same health plan that their congressman gets. I think it should be eminently sellable. And um, it's similar to what Paul Ryan talks about, but he doesn't actually do it. So in our program, we actually do it. We just give everybody the federal employee health plan. Everybody on Medicare gets the federal employee health plan. Saves a trillion over 10 years and does uh, actually, uh, according to our projections, would uh, uh, er eradicate the uh, shortfall for Medicare. So I guess that I would stop there since I fixed Social Security and Medicare. I don't want to really brag or anything. So uh, thank you for the. Now I just need a few votes. If I only had a few votes to support my ideas, but we didn't get any support from Democrats on this. In fact, one of the Democrats' main complaints. I tried to talk to some who I thought might might discuss the issue. Their main complaint was that Obamacare uh, got rid of. Um, for congressmen, we're no longer part of the federal employee health plan, and it, there's a question whether or not it has to go into a uh, some kind of exchange like Obamacare. So they said we couldn't do it because we were, were getting rid of the one part of government that actually kind of works, which is a federal employee health plan. So, but anyway, I'll stop there, and I'll be happy to answer questions. This is a larger than usual turnout, and one reason, obviously, is that you're seen as a potential presidential contender for 2016. What's the current state of your thinking on that possibility? You know, I want to be part of the national debate, so whether I run or not, uh, being considered is, is something that allows me to have, a, I think, a larger microphone. Um, we've, we will continue to travel to the early primary states. I'll be in Iowa. I'll be in New Hampshire this spring. I think I'll also be in South Carolina in the summertime. So um, um, we're considering it. You know, we won't make a decision before 2014. The last one from me, and then we'll go to Stephanie. Um, 
Stephanie K. I won't attempt the last name because I'll just be embarrassed. Sam Youngman, and I think Mark Shields is waving his hand at me. If not, Mark, you'll get a question. So, um, just one though. Just one. All right. um, in your view, do the bombings in Boston have any policy implications either on gun control or immigration? You know, I, I think it's it's largely a mistake to talk about issues in this in the wake of crisis and in the wake of tragedy. You know, the one thing that's disappointed me about, I think gun control is a legitimate uh, issue for our country to debate and decide where and how we can fix the problems of violence. But I really hate to see it. I'm a parent and I have three boys and I hate to see it in, in using people, I think, as, as props and politicizing people's tragedy. I mean, when I see the father and the mothers and them testifying, and I know they're coming voluntarily and they, they want to come and be part of this debate, but it still saddens me just to see them. And I, th I think that uh, um, in some cases the president has used them as props and uh, I, it, uh, that, that disappoints me. Um, and the way I'd look at it, I do look at it a, in a little bit in the sense of the tragedy. How could we have prevented the tragedy? And that's really why I come down on the side of not being for any of the proposals, because none of the proposals really would address the tragedy. Stephanie Kay from the Financial Times. Guantanamo Bay, uh, on, the, on the prison in Guantanamo? Um, you know, I have not voted for any of the limitations on sending, there have been several amendments on sending people to Guantanamo Bay or not sending them there, and I have not uh, voted on any of the limitations on that. I don't know that there is, that I have a great answer, uh, to tell you the truth. Um, there is a, a part of me that really does believe that you even captured internationally you ought to be accused of a crime, you know, and that people held indefinitely. I objected strongly to sending Americans there, and it surprises me that there are members of the U.S. Senate that would send Americans to Guantanamo Bay without charge, without trial, indefinitely. It disappoints me that the president, who, when he was a senator, appeared to be a little more of a civil libertarian, uh, has said, well, I'm going to sign indefinite detention, but he said the same thing on drones. I don't intend to use them. Well, to me, that's sort of not strong enough language. He should have, he should have vetoed and never signed the NDAA because we should not have on the books the power for any president to indefinitely detain Americans, send them to Guantanamo Bay without a trial or an accusation. So for Americans, I have really strong feelings. For others, it, it is difficult knowing what to do and I think there's sort of a spectrum. I think Americans, anybody accused of a crime in America gets due process without question, without exception, and I think it's, a, it's an absolute. If you're overseas and you're captured in a battlefield and you're shooting at us, I think you get no due process, probably zero due process if you're firing a weapon at us or you're involved in a battle. Then there's sort of a murky in between of those who we think are committing maybe battle during the daytime and now are sleeping in their house at night. And so they're, you know, what do you do when you capture those people? Where do you take them? If you bring them to the U.S., do you then have to have due process? There are a lot of questions, and I don't think there are easy questions on this, but I haven't come down on the position of, of closing Guantanamo Bay. Sam? Senator, I'd like to go back to the Commonwealth if I could. Um, your, after your primary, most of the calls I was getting oppo against you telling me how terrible you were were from Republicans in Kentucky uh, who, were lo who were loyal to Trey, no loyal to, to uh, Senator McConnell. Uh, there was a rift between you and the senator that you could run the derby through. I guess my question is, how much are you willing, how, how hard are you going to work for him to get reelected? I've endorsed him. I've raised money for him. And, uh, um, you know, I will work to try to see him reelected. I think he's good for Kentucky. Let me just follow up. How do you view him? Is he a mentor? Is he somebody you're learning from? Is he, or is he somebody you're not quite on the same, same um, page with? You know, Thoreau is a mentor. You know, I think uh, <laughs> when we call people... <laughs> When we call people a mentor, I think that overstates. I mean, we're colleagues, and I do respect him, and he's been here a long time. He has a lot of uh, knowledge of the Senate, and we, uh, we work together on a lot of things. We were just uh, down in Kentucky working on freedom to fish, keeping the, the federal government out of our uh, fishing rights next to the dam. So, um, 
you know, we interact on a lot of things. And really, to tell you the truth, I think uh, what I would say about Senator McConnell is, is that I don't think he ever personally disliked me. You know, people run, people work against each other in campaigns, and particularly people who've been involved in politics for a long time. I think don't take it very personally. And so, the one thing he did, and he was, which was a, a very, uh, I think, significant thing for me and for the party, was he called us all up three months before the primary and said, "I want you to sign a promise to come to a unity rally three days after the election." And it was a stroke of genius to do that, because then we didn't bicker. It wasn't sort of the establishment against the upstart. Everybody showed up. All the Republican congressmen, my opponent showed up, both of my opponents showed up. And uh, it was a good thing, but it was a smart thing on his point. Did you think Trey was going to win at that point? Mm -hmm. No, I think he actually didn't know at that point. The polls had really shifted. This was a month or two before, and we were actually doing pretty well in the polls at that point. Um, no, and some might have thought maybe I wouldn't sign that pledge, but I, I did. And, you know, the, I wanted there to be no question I was supporting the Republican nominee. And that's, you know, sort of been my approach with the presidential politics and everything. You know, I said I was going to support the nominee, you know, once my dad uh, acknowledged that the nomination was over. Mark? Uh, Senator, I want to salute you for being the first person in memory to crack at McConnell and throw in the same <laughs> It's a concept that... Uh, some of us have to get our hands around right now. I uh, wanted to ask you, in your own lifetime, what president of the other party do you most admire and why? Uh, probably Grover Cleveland. Um, he stood... Oh, that's not your eye? Okay. Yeah. Well, he's, he's quick. We've, he's we've got quick. lots of rules he's here, quick. you know. So I have to answer his question. I can't answer the question I want to answer. Well, now, I was told that I could that answer the question. Still applies. Oh, in my lifetime, a Democrat... Uh, so, um, you know, I guess Kennedy was a president while I was, uh, I was like six months old, I think, when he was, sh he was shot in, uh, f f yeah, 63, but it's fall of, or summer or fall? November, November yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm six months old, so he would, it would be from Kennedy on forward. Uh, not an LBJ fan, definitely. I think he was sort of a, a creature and a, a, of something that, uh, you know, out of Washington, and there's a lot of things that I think are bad that come out of Washington. And I, you know, even though he's from Texas, I, you know, it's just a lot I wasn't too happy with LBJ. Uh, you know, then you've got Jimmy Carter, who I think is the best ex president we've ever had. I'll put him in that category, and a lot of people have said that. Um, you know, and you've got Clinton. You know, I, I think the only one that I could, you know, that, that some conservatives point to, and I might as well, would be, uh, you know, that uh, people point to Kennedy reducing taxes and uh, actually growing the economy as well as uh, reducing unemployment and as well as, uh, you know, increasing, um, uh, I think revenue actually increased even though he cut rates, you know. So I, I'd probably say Kennedy. And I think Kennedy also captured the American imagination somewhat. Um, I think falsely sometimes, though, too, because I think the media gave him a pass. And, you know, nowadays I don't think that would happen probably to, to either side. But, uh, you know, but I, probably, I guess I'd say Kennedy among one since I've been living. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Senator, you spoke at Howard University last week. Um, how do you think your message was perceived there? And do you plan on doing any more outreach speeches like that? And if so, what would you do differently next um, time? About three days later, I spoke to Simmons College, which is a historically black college in Louisville. I thought my reception at Howard was much better than my reception from the left-wing media. So if you're here from the left-wing media, I didn't appreciate your reception. But uh, Howard, actually, I think was very fair. I'd never met Kurt Schmoke before, but I've always been a fan of Kurt Schmoke's. Um, I told him that I could remember back in probably when he was mayor, uh, Reason Magazine writing about him and about him uh, trying to decriminalize and lessen some of the penalties for nonviolent crime, which I've always been a supporter of. And so uh, I enjoyed meeting Kurt Smoke. And, uh, you know, we have a bill on mandatory minimums that I'm working with Leahy. We actually may try to see if he'll come back and testify if he likes the bill. Um, so, no, I think the reception was good. I think people, I'll give you an example of how sometimes reporting's not accurate. One young man stood up and said, I worked for a pro-Obama super PAC registering voters. Somebody in the media described him as someone who was just a, from a generic uh, voter registration group. He said he worked for the president. So, I mean, 
that's a difficult vote for me to get. It's a difficult person even to get, you know, entree into them considering Republicans. So it wasn't an easy, easy audience, but I thought it was a beginning of a conversation. The other thing I would say is that, you know, and things that annoy me is that people want to just, you know, I was completely blasted by some of the left wing for being out of touch and knowing nothing about the Southern strategy, and that's why African Americans became Democrats, which is flat out wrong. Look at the facts. In a huge way, and the statistics aren't great in the 20s, but they say Hoover, some say Hoover may have gotten two-thirds of the African-American vote, and some say by uh, most of the uh, statistics in 32 say Roosevelt got two-thirds of the vote. It changed in a huge way in 1932. Uh, south side of Chicago was Republican, had a Republican congressman. He was elected 26, 28, 30, and 32. He loses in 34 in the south side of Chicago, becomes Democrat in 1934. So for people to tell me, oh, it had the reason Republicans are hated by African-American community is because of the Southern strategy, it may have cemented the change, but the change did happen during the Great Depression. And I think it's wrong of us. And, and the change happened, and I said this in my speech, and most people ignored it, the change happened among whites and blacks. A lot of people switched their registration in the 1930s. Roosevelt won overwhelming victories, but the one thing he did is the African-American vote changed in 1932. It increased in 1936 when um, Truman endorses civil rights uh, in 1948. The Dixiecrats break off, but the vote becomes overwhelmingly African-American vote for Truman. He also integrated the armed services. So you get to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and you got 90% of the people, African-Americans, voting for, for LBJ. The Southern strategy, by most reports, is after that, not before that. So it's solidified, but it didn't cause the change. And people who write that are just factually wrong. But they do it simply, I think, for partisan purposes, because why, how a Republican's not allowed to go and be part of that debate and, and talk about it. And it really did have to do with the Great Depression. It had to do, I think, with, you know, and everybody can have an opinion. It had to do with a lot of things. But I think it had to do with economic, uh, the lack of uh, economic emancipation among African Americans. Uh, they, they wanted more, and they didn't feel like they were getting it from Republicans. And in terms of doing it again and doing more, just to follow up? Yes. Um, uh, I plan on doing yes again and more. And I've done one already since then at Simmons College. And, um, you know, we'll continue to do that. And I think, but it's, it's anybody who thinks it's going to be easy and that all of a sudden we're going to switch. Although I would say the one thing that's encouraging from history is the amazing switch from 28 to 32. If, there, if you could get a Republican that could switch the vote like 28 to 32, all of a sudden things would be topsy-turvy. But I would say if you change Ohio from 5% African Americans voting Republican to 10%, all of a sudden Ohio comes into play. Uh, we're going to go next to um, Carl Lubstorf, Michael Warren, John Ward, Jim Avila, Robert Schlesinger, David Grant, Jerry Zermski. Uh, Mr. Lubstorf. Senator, I'd like to go back to gun control. When, you, when you, someone raised the subject, your first answer was to talk about ch children being used as props, which is frankly sort of a red herring because that's really not what the issue is. Do you think there's a problem that needs to be dealt with, or do you think there's no problem? If it's a red herring, then you're saying the president bringing all those families here is a red herring? Why don't you answer the question directly about what you think should be done in the area if something should be done? No, but rather if than you're saying the it's theatrics. a red herring for me to bring up my kids, is it a red herring for the president to bring up the children who were shot? Well, maybe, but, but that's not the issue in gun control. Well, I think it is because the thing is, is that I'm, I'm someone who's presenting a face to the public. And the face I want to present is that I do care about those kids and that I understand the grief that they're going through and that I do care about it. So I think, you know, politics isn't about the fa only about the facts. It is about whether you're seen as being empathetic. And I do want people to know that I do care about those families and I understand their grief. Do you, but do you think there's anything the federal government ought to do that would create more safety um, by, by re restricting access or by registering Right. Guns so that you know criminals and and uh, terrorists and various people right. can't have access to them so easily. The, the current background checks that we have uh, found 15,000 people to be felons and that were kicked out of the system. We prosecuted 44 of them. So I am supporting Senator Cruz's legislation to shift money around and increase the prosecution of those who are felons. I think it's simplistic to say, oh well, they didn't. We stopped 15,000 felons from getting guns. 
Well, maybe they went to another dealer that wasn't as precise, or maybe they bought them illegally. If you didn't prosecute them, you didn't stop them from getting guns. You stopped them at that place from getting a gun. So I think if, if uh, what we ought to do is uh, make sure that the background checks that we have are working, and I do favor that. Um, and the bill may do a few other things. Um, but uh, I do think that ultimately, this is the way I look at it, and this is just my opinion. But I, I think it's shared by a lot of Americans. The shootings at Sandy Hook, um, that young man who committed these atrocious murders, he was not deterred by the death penalty. He was not deterred by life imprisonment. He was not deterred by being killed because in the event, at the end, he killed himself. Most of these killers are exactly the same. They usually die in the end. They don't seem to be afraid to die. So I don't think if they're not afraid of the death penalty that somehow they're going to fear gun registration and that gun registration would deter them. They seem to be choosing places that are gun-free gun zones. And so another thing that I would do, and more, more of this probably involves local law than federal law, but uh, if I were in charge of that school district, I would be lobbying to allow teachers to have concealed carry, to have a gun locked up in a desk drawer, um, you know, for the principal to have it. Ultimately, that's the only thing I know of that might have saved any lives in this situation, because we have gun registration up there. The cities that we have the most significant gun control seem to have the most significant crime in our country. Michael, I'm sorry. What's wrong with their concept of universal registration? I think, one, it doesn't go to the problem. If the problem is mass shootings by, by young men at uh, gun-free zones, registration doesn't deter these young men. Registration works for law-abiding citizens. Uh, nearly, if you look at crime, nearly 90 percent of crime is committed by guns that are bought illegally already. If you look at uh, gun shows, I think in 2004 they did a survey of inmates and it was like uh, uh, 1, 1 1.7 percent were committed with guns from uh, gun shows. So, uh, you know, I think that let's, you know, if the background checks work, why don't we enforce what we've got? And I think that would be a good first step forward. I think a lot of things in Washington are done as window dressing. Um, it's, 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 it's a dog and pony show, it's a parade, it's theatrics and histrionics, all to show people that something bad happened, which it did, something terrible and tragic happened. I don't want to uh, demean or, or in any way lessen that, but the response to it is, hey, look at me, I did something, even though in the end, and there have been, I think, uh, you know, uh, Richard Cohen in the, in the Washington Post is probably not considered to be a, you know, a right-wing zealot on the Second Amendment, but he wrote yesterday that the background checks won't do anything, you Michael, know, even in, even making them universal. Michael Warren? Uh, there used to be a debate, you don't hear much about it anymore, uh, in the conservative movement about Abraham Lincoln's legacy with a lot of these issues that you were talking about, rule of law, due process, uh, that sort of thing. And you spoke a lot about Abraham Lincoln last week at Howard. Uh, I'm just curious what your, uh, what your opinion of, of Abraham Lincoln, uh, his legacy is. There's a great book uh, on Lincoln called Forced into Glory by uh, Lerone Bennett. And uh, it's a good book. And there's a great, there's a great passage in there um, that uh, it's, I think it's by a Reconstruction Republican. They have a quote as one of the leads in the chapter. And he says uh, that uh, Lincoln shouldn't be allowed to uh, ride into glory on uh, the borrowed plumage, you know, the, from somebody else's uh, hat, from their from their glorious ride, and I think there's uh, some truth to that. I think Lincoln turned out to be a great politician, but I think he wasn't a god. He was a politician, and he came into his glory because of some people who I think were even greater than he was. And the people I would consider to be greater than Lincoln would be the abolitionists who pushed him, uh, kicking and screaming towards emancipation. Um, so, uh, no, in the end, Lincoln was, a, I think, absolutely a great president. It was uh, something, you know, emancipation is nothing to, is something to, to be very proud of uh, for, for him and for the Republican Party. But uh, really, I, I think our history books, when I grew up reading, all the, all the description of abolitionists were zealots, nuts, crazy. And uh, it's a lot more complicated than that. And a lot of them, you know, William Lloyd Garrison fought this battle for 30 some odd years, was beaten up, mobbed, nearly killed, you know. So uh, I think that, uh, I, I think the uh, abolitionists deserve more, uh, more credit than they're given. John Ward. Senator, I just wanted to go back to uh, Howard, and I, I'm sensitive to your concern that the whole event was portrayed uh, negatively. I, I don't mean to suggest that. 
I think the reception was at, at many points um, pretty good. But there was that moment where um, you seem to be assuming that the students didn't know some things about history. Is that accurate that you made some assumptions that turned out to be wrong? And, and what else? Did no, you and I think that was I think that was misreported. I simply said something, and and it it was something that. Um, I was asking a question. I asked, do you know? And I didn't know the answer. This was, my, this was my first time to go to a historically black college, so I asked, and people say, well, you should know the answer. Well, that was part of the reason for going there is I didn't know the answer. I said, did they all know that uh, the NAACP was founded by Republicans? And in retrospect, it sounds like it is a dumb question, but it's like Republicans haven't been going to Howard for 20 years, so maybe by me going there, I did learn something, and I did learn that everybody there knows, and I left knowing that, that everybody there knows. But here's a, here's a good question for you, and this is where I think it's unfair what the media tries to do to me on this. Take a poll. Well, here's a good example of a poll. When the Iraq War started, right after 9-11, they polled Americans and they said, um, how many of you, uh, or who do you think, you know, attacked us on 9-11? Over 50% of the public thought Iraq attacked us on 9-11. It's still true. Probably 50% of the public still doesn't know. If you ask the American public, this includes a lot of white people who haven't had black history, but even some people in the African-American community, you ask them, did the Republicans, were they a, a primary part of voting rights and citizenship and NAACP getting formed and ending Jim Crow? And did you know that most African-Americans were Republicans at one time? People who've taken black history do know that, and I, I, was, I was told that in no uncertain terms. But I think the vast majority of the public, I think you'd find that 90% of the public has no idea that Republicans helped to found the NAACP. And so some people think, well, it's, uh, it, it's presumptuous and I shouldn't be talking about it. Well, we need to talk about it. And then I messed up on the senator's name, Edward Brooke, and it's like, I'm human. I forgot his name. I knew his name, but I forgot it. It wasn't like it was part of my speech and I forgot it. It was in question and answer. How many other people do 30 minutes of question and answer and I forgot his name? But the, the point I was making that, that uh, was from Edward Brooke was he was asked in his 90s about the, the rich history of uh, the Republican Party and African Americans and he was asked, um, do you know, he, his response was he said, well, if the Democrats had this history, you'd hear about it nonstop. And he said it was sort of, he was, the indication was a problem that Republicans didn't talk about their rich history. It is harder for me, I'm not African American, to go to Howard and talk about it. It would be easier for an African American Republican maybe to go, because then it seemed less as me trying to preach to people about their history. But it's all of our history. You know, I mean, there were there were whites involved too with abolition and getting rid and with emancipation. So I don't know. I'm a little sensitive to some of it in the sense that I think uh, I think the people who write on one side of it write simply because they don't like Republicans, and so anything a Republican says, the, the left wing media I think is done that way uh, without really um, I think looking at the facts. Same with the, same with the Southern strategy. I think they're completely wrong on the Southern strategy. The Southern strategy cemented a change, but the change occurred before the Southern strategy. That's just a fact. Sorry, Jim. Senator, I'm going to stand up since I can't really see you over there. But um, I have two questions. I think they're related. Uh, the first one is on the immigration bill. Uh, I wonder if we could ask you your reaction, your response to what has actually now been written, and are you now willing to endorse a pathway to citizenship? And I use that particular word uh, for those who are undocumented. The second question I think is related. Uh, is will this bill, do you, will immigration reform help America's drug problem and would it help in, in the Rand Paul America that would decriminalize some of these drugs uh, if, if there is uh, an immigration reform bill? Um, the bill's pretty long and it, last night when I left to go home it still wasn't available and I'm assuming, does anybody know, is it now online? It's yes. Now online. Yeah. So we're going to read it is the first thing we'll do and uh, that'll take a while to read all of it. There are a lot of details in it. What I will tell you in general is I am for immigration reform. Uh, I am for finding a place for those who are in our country, whether documented or undocumented, finding a place for them if they want to work. Uh, it's not that I'm going to be for anything with no rules, though. Conservatives have always said they wanted uh, secure borders. They always complained about the 1986 bill and said they promised us security and we never got the secure borders. So I will have an, at least one amendment, but I probably will have three or four amendments that I want to be attached to the bill to think that I think will make it stronger. 
I think it's important for everybody who wants immigration reform to realize it has to go through the House. The House is very conservative and controlled by Republicans who haven't been too excited about immigration reform. So in order to get it, I think they need to, to at least uh, engage with people like me who want immigration reform but are from the conservative wing of the party. Um, the, the amendment I have is trust but verify, and it says that each year, in order for the reform to go forward, there has to be a report on border security. This should include the opinions of the governors. This should include the opinions of the border patrol on whether or not each section of the fe either fence or border has been secured. It should include statistics on uh, how many are uh, being returned to come here illegally, how many people are getting background checks, that kind of, that kind of thing. And uh, that report, I think, should be voted on by Congress. I don't, I'm not a big fan of administrative uh, reports. They, you know, we're supposed to get a report on whether Egypt is democratic in order for them to get their foreign, foreign aid, and they just either give it or exempt it every year. They, I don't think there's enough uh, um, really seriousness on the part of any administration on these reports. So I'd have it voted on by Congress, because you can get rid of your congressman or woman if you don't like them. Um, but uh, I am in general for immigration reform. As far as a pathway to citizenship, I think the other thing is, is I think it's important for conservatives to support the bill that it's no new pathway to citizenship. Um, my opinion all along has been that if you're here and you're undocumented and we give you a work visa, that we allow you then to get in the same line that someone gets in if they're in Mexico City. So if you're in Mexico City right now and you want to become an American citizen, there is a line. If you're a, an undocumented uh, alien here in this country and you, we give you a work visa, I'd say you get in the same line. My understanding, the bill's going to create a new line, but give a certain amount of years that, uh, to try to make it where you don't get in front of somebody in the other line. Some of this is a rhetorical point, but it's also important to a lot of people uh, who don't want a new pathway. So I think if it were the same pathway as someone in Mexico City, we have a better chance of passing immigration reform. And so that's something we'll look at. We also think that when you go to vote through Motor Voter, you're supposed to show up with your driver's license. I think that when you show up with your driver's license, no matter who you are, you should be run through the uh, work visa uh, database to make sure you're not here on a work visa, because there's going to be millions of people here on work visas now, and they shouldn't be uh, immediately eligible to vote just because they have a driver's license. Same with welfare. I think uh, all of these have an exclusion for welfare. But if you're not allowed to ask or check whether you're here legally or not, there could well be people signing up for welfare. So with all the rules, yes, I'm in favor of it. We'll see how many of any of these things I can get attached to it. But I think some of these things will be popular in the House. And if we want to move forward, um, I think that hopefully they'll address some of these things. Mr. Schlesinger. criticism of the Howard speech was that you um, in your characterization of the history of the two parties and their, and their roles in the civil rights movement you sort of glossed over the past 50 years, post-1965. post, post 1965. How would you characterize the, the, the two parties' roles in, in civil rights in, in that time period? Well, you know, if you go up to 1964 and you look at it, like, for example, I think there were two civil rights bills in the 50s that didn't pass, and I think Kennedy votes against both of them and a majority of Republican senators vote for both of them. Same, same happens in, in, uh, in 64. Um, still, a vast majority of Republicans vote for the Civil Rights Act in 64. The Southern strategy, I didn't mention, but I, w I didn't really kind of go there to sort of mention the things that don't make us look so good in the Republican Party. So that was one reason for not bringing up the Southern strategy. And the comments by Kevin Phillips were unsavory and, and not something that will help us ever, you know, and probably did hurt us in solidifying the African American vote, frankly. But they, they, I guess my point is just they didn't cause it. Um, and you can follow up with that. Was there something else you were asking? Well, how do you characterize the, the, the history post-65? Oh, well, I think some of it's fair and some of it's unfair. I mean, uh, people have told me they think that, uh, you know, the uh, Willie Brown ad was racist. People say that Reagan talking about welfare queens was racist. There may be some argument to some of those things. Uh, what's that? Yeah, what did I say? Yeah, see, I do make mistakes. I do make mistakes. But anyway, so uh, that's that's what I meant. But I think the um, yeah that there are, there I think there is some uh, basis in arguments that they uh, of of some of the the tactics uh, through the years, and so I think 
And the other thing is, whether it's fair or not fair, there is a perception out there, the Republican Party, um, and I think this is what it is in general. There's a perception that Republicans don't like people of color. They don't like black people, brown people, or people of different color skin. It's not true, but that's the perception that we have to overcome. And the only way we overcome that, I think, is by showing up and saying over and over again that it is not true. And I wanted part of that to be talking about our rich history in civil rights. I think that's an uphill battle, too, because I got a lot of, you know, I got a lot of grief for even for the audacity of, of mentioning it. Um, but uh, I think if we, I don't know, I think it's a rich history. I'll keep trying. I'll, I'm sort of, you know, I don't give up easily, so I'll keep trying. We've got about 15 minutes left. We're going to go to the back tables now. David uh, Grant and then Jerry Zarimsky. David. Senator, you said you're skeptical of it, sort of administration reports and them sort of grading their own homework, so to speak. Uh, but of course, the bill that the Senate Gang of Eight has put forward, that's how the immigration, that's how people get legalized, is the Department of Homeland Security has to submit two reports within six months. So it sounds that you're somewhat skeptical of that. And I would just ask you if you're interested on a separate point of reaching out to Hispanic communities of doing some of the things that you're doing in the African American community um, um, with Hispanics as well. Uh, Yes, I've you know been to speak to the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce not too long ago, and that was uh, a beginning of of what I will consider to be uh, you know trying to go and talk to um, you know when I first ran, people said you need that's Mrs. Smith over there. You need to ask Mrs. Smith for a vote, and I thought it was kind of corny. I'm a physician. I thought you just told people what you represented, and they went home and made their decision. But they're like, oh no, you got to ask Mrs. Smith for her vote. And I think uh, symbolically there, that's true with Republicans and different ethnic groups where we do not seem to be doing well is we need to show up and ask for their vote. And that sounds corny. And, you, you know, I showed up at Howard. Did I, did I get anybody to change their mind? I don't know. But I showed up at Simmons two days later, and, uh, you know, one gentleman came up and uh, said he wants to start Facebook for Rand Paul. African Americans for Rand Paul. So, you know, and maybe that was only one person out of 50, but it's still a step forward. And, um, but I think that, uh, you know, we try on the reports. You know, I think overall border security is more important. You talked about what, whether the executive branch makes some determinations on who gets the visas. You know, there will be administrative stuff that has to be part of the executive branch. So I'm not completely opposed to that. I'm just saying border security has been what conservatives have complained about, it's what they're fearful of. I think it limits. There's some conservatives who will never vote for any immigration reform. But there's another big block of conservatives that I think I'm part of that will vote for immigration reform if they're assured and reassured that the border will be secure. So there's some votes you're not going to get, but there's a huge amount. I don't think this is a great thing for the House if it takes 180 Democrats and 40 Republicans to pass you know, over in the House, or if it passes with 50 Democrats on our side and five Republicans, you know. So, um, you know, I I'm looking for a way to make uh, more of the Republican Party come over and, and embrace immigration reform. Do you think that, sorry, just, just to be specific, do you think that that's a problem that they've set up at the beginning? I mean, the first, the very first portion of the Senate bill is the administration basically says, this is our plan. Then people get legalized, you know, whether it's in six, you know, within six months after the bill is enacted. I mean, do you think that that's an impediment, as you pointed out, to conservatives getting on board with this, particularly perhaps in the House? Maybe. I mean, all the conservatives in the House, and still the House plan is to do a bunch of different bills. And I was always a fan of that, actually, really, too. And everybody said, oh, you'll never get comprehensive reform if you do them one at a time and you take the most popular ones. I disagree. I think everything in Washington is broken because every bill is too big and every deal attempts to be too big. So for example, like on tax reform, tomorrow I would lower the income tax. We can compromise on the number. I'd lower it to 17% tomorrow. Just do it. I don't care if, it, if people predicted less revenue. Less revenue up here means more revenue in the economy. It'd be an enormous boost to the economy. And really, like under Kennedy, like under Coolidge, and like under Reagan, when you reduce rates, sometimes you get more revenue. So, uh, but it's because the deal's too big. Same way with immigration. We make it harder on ourselves, or the debt commission, or any of these things. We make it a lot harder to find a deal when it has a thousand moving parts. I think we should go with the things we agree on and just boom, 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 just start, you know, that. It's why the public's upset with us. They're like, why don't we ever pass anything? Why can't we get along? Well, all the stuff we agree on, we won't pass because we say, oh, that's going to be the sweetener for the bigger deal, which we never seem to be able to get. So why not break up all these big deals into smaller deals? I tried to pass the STEM visas, the science and technology visas, expanding those, the Raul Labrador bill. I tried to pass it by unanimous consent. 
And then Schumer came up and said, no, but I'll pass, how about passing mine by unanimous consent? And I was actually quiet. I would have let his go by unanimous consent, too. They'd have been shocked by that. But uh, then we'd have gotten something done. I think it would, have been, it would have been great fun to see that all of a sudden we passed part of immigration reform just by unanimous consent. Jerry? Uh, yes, the guy from Buffalo, I have to ask you why you think so highly of our, our late mayor, Grover Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I was allowed to go back to when I wasn't alive, uh, you know, he seemed to be uh, opposed to special interests. He also seemed to veto a bunch of bills. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, it, it was a time period, and I think he, some would call him a populist, and I think that I have a part of me uh, feels that way. We're going to probably just get in two more, Alex Bolton and then Doyle. Alex. Uh, hi. It was, it was reported that you were raising money for the uh, National Association for Gun Rights, and it was also reported that <coughs> last week this came up for conversation in the steering committee luncheon. Susan Collins was pretty upset about that because National Association for Gun Rights is running ads in her state. She's warning it could cost the party her seat. Um, are you going to not do that in the future? Are you going to change your course of action, given what you know, Colin said to you, given that perhaps you could be jeopardizing a seat in Maine? Um, when you say raising money for I have signed f uh, fundraising letters for them. I don't have a connection with a group. It's illegal for me to have a direct connection with a group or to talk about what ads they run or not. Also illegal for me uh, to actually call them up and say quit running ads against certain people. Now I can make a decision in the future over whether I'll continue to do it, and I haven't come to a conclusion or thought that through yet. Um, but I can say I don't always agree with every tactic of every group out there. Um, you know, that includes a lot of groups. You know, there are three big gun groups, uh, National Association of Gun Rights, Gun Owners of America, and uh, the NRA. And I don't agree with all of them all the time, but uh, I, I want to be, I am on the side of wanting to protect the Second Amendment and believe it's just as important as the other parts of the Bill of Rights. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't know with regard to that. I am not, I have never worked against any Republican in our primary, and I don't anticipate working against a Republican in our primary. Well, what sort of role do you see yourself having in the 2014 Republican primaries, even if, maybe if not, do you see yourselves getting involved in a race, you know, with... We with, got with involved, we got involved in some primaries that were open primaries, where there wasn't an incumbent, but at, the, at this time I don't have any plans to oppose uh, any incumbent uh, Republican. Doyle? Senator, let me ask you to return to the subject of your filibuster, and that was drones, and particularly turn to drones overseas. What's next on your agenda on, on that issue? Have you found any Democratic civil libertarians who are working with you? And then on one particular issue, as you know, a lot of the drone war overseas is being waged under an authorization for use of military force that was passed in haste, uh, what, 11, 12 years ago. Uh, are you working to, 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 to re-examine that, and have you got anything going there? Um, Ron Wyden is the one I work most closely with on civil liberty issues and the drone issue, and he was nice enough to come to the floor in support of the filibuster, and so he and I continue to work on a range of issues. That we worked on the SOPA legislation together. Uh, we are co-sponsors of a federal waiver for hemp uh, growing in the states, things like that. Um, on issues of war, I don't want to characterize his position, but his and Merkley's, we've worked together. I think Wyden's been on those letters we've sent to the president to speed up the resolution of the Afghan war. And then the second, this, oh, the authorization of force. I think we have a chance to talk about this. It'll be tricky to see where we can go with this. Senator Corker has talked about bringing this up in the Foreign Relations Committee. It is a real significant problem that and, and it's part of this thing that I was talking about with the drones. There are people in my party who think the, the battlefield is everywhere and the war has no limits and that this use of authorization of force to go to war in Afghanistan is for war everywhere all the time without limits. I have a real problem with that, particularly when they say the battlefield is here because I do acknowledge that if you're engaged in a battlefield, for example, if you're in Afghanistan, we're fighting soldiers over there, we're not going to give them Miranda rights. There is no due process in a battle. It, it becomes a little more of a question if they're eating dinner in their house, and then it's even bigger question if you're eating dinner in America in, in, in a cafe or in your house. So it, that was a huge question, but it works all the way back. There's a spectrum of still needing it. And also, can you go to war in Mali uh, or Libya under the use of authorization of force that was done for Afghanistan? But I'll tell you how hard this battle will be. I tried to remove the use of force, uh, authorization of force for Iraq last year, and the war's over there. I couldn't get them to stop a war that's already done. 
And uh, but the reason why I think it's important to take the use of authorization force back, that's, that's the people's power and Congress's power. It's, it's ultimately the people's power through Congress, but it, that's, that was power was separated. And as long as we have it dangling out there, we've given carte blanche to any president to commit war anytime, anywhere. And then there's the debate of whether or not uh, they can infringe upon civil liberties here at home through that force. So, no, it's going to, I don't think we'll completely get rid of it. I think what they'll do is try to rewrite it. I'd be for, I'm first, I'm for ending the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan, and I would rescind both. And uh, then I would have debates over where you want to go again. Really, that's what uh, they intended, is that we would debate and discuss whether national security is involved, whether vital interests are involved. And Mali is different than Afghanistan. I think the country was almost universally united. Let's go to Afghanistan and get those people attacked, us, myself included. I don't know that the public's entirely united on going into Syria, Mali, or Libya. And, um, you know, I think there's... You know, I keep saying, why don't we ask the million Christians in Syria what they want, you know. They, they were displaced, 250,000 of them were displaced from Iraq because they didn't like the government they got in Iraq after the war. And uh, are they going to like al-Nusra as their, their new government in Syria? I, I venture to say some of the Christians may object. We had, I promised to have the senator up and moving um, by uh, 925, and I don't think we have time for another question and answer, so we want to thank you. My apologies to my colleagues who didn't get a question. We'll have to have him back. Thanks so much, sir. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Come on. And it's all well with your dinner. Does he still do a traveling? Sam, followers, later, I have the extra space, spending.